So Bruce Merrill works at the South African Radio, Astronomy, Radio Astronomy, Astronomy Observatory, and apparently he really likes doing programming competitions. Um, it's going to be an interesting talk. You to see. Right, so morning everyone. Uh, as I said, I'm at the South African Radio Astronomy Observatory. If you previously knew me as someone who worked at SKA, SA, it's basically the same thing where we merged with the Hart Biostock Radio Observatory. So it's now a unit, the combined thing is called the South African Radio Astronomy Observatory, which is a bit of a mouthful. But at least, um, yeah, that's where I am. And we're talking about async IO today. I think it's an a uh, topic that's becoming a, a lot more prevalent. Uh, there's, I know of two other talks at this conference that sort of deal with async IO. So you can look forward to those, and hopefully I'll have given you the basics you need to follow along for those. Hopefully I don't steal all their slides by uh, telling you everything I'm going to tell you. So uh, just an outline of the talk. I'll talk about programming in general and what it is and why you want to do it, then look at async IO specifically, and then sort of get into various bits and pieces of the API. And the sections I think are particularly interesting is practical tips on how you actually debug this. OK, so what is concurrent programming? Well, it's not threads, basically. Um, threads can be very useful uh, to scale your code, but they have problems, one of which is code like this. Uh, don't worry about the last few lines. That's kind of boilerplate. What are we doing is we're creating four threads, each of which is going to increment this global variable one million times. Does anyone want to guess what? And then at the end, we print out what we got. Anyone want to guess what the output's going to be? Less than four million is the correct answer. When I ran it, it came up with this. Uh, and the reason that happens is on line seven, you say a plus equals one, that's actually several operations. It's load the value of a from the global, add one to it, write it back into that global. And two threads can be doing that at the same time. So they'll both load, say, zero. They'll both increment it to one, and they'll both back, write back one. So now you've done two of these increment operations, but a only contains one. And that's something called the race condition, uh, where two different threads are operating on the same data at the same time. And there's ways to deal with that, things called locks. But it makes your life trickier, because you've got to think about these things. And sometimes these things only crop up later on in production, <coughs> and only when you, well, the phase of the moon is wrong, and so on. Um, but there's another problem, which is, let's have a look at how you might want to use it. When you first start writing a server, it's very tempting threads are very tempting to think, oh, I can handle one connection and one thread, and it doesn't have to deal with what all the other connections are doing. And you'll have a simple loop that says, OK, I'm going to read a, some sort of request off this connection. I'm going to do something with it, and then I'll send back a reply. Um, question is, that says, while connection is open, what you really want is, while connection is open and no one has shut down the server, and stopping when you have threads can actually be a lot more challenging. So threads suck. Let's not do that. Um, so in terms of some uh, words you might, uh, definitions you might see, uh, there's concurrency and there's parallelism. And that's uh, quite a nice way of uh, defining the difference. That's from Rob Pike, who's uh, one of the primary authors of Go. Uh, but concurrent programming is basically about having multiple tasks active but you only work on one of them at a time. Whereas threads, you're actually trying to work on them all at the same time, and that's where you get on top of your, each other. And so the main difference is, instead of just switching randomly whenever the Python global interpreter lock happens to that you switch between threads, you're in control of when things, when you switch from one task to another. And it's typically when you reach some point where you have to wait for something. So where you maybe need to wait for more request on a connection, that's a point where you can switch to dealing with some data or requests that have already arrived on another connection. Um, often the reason people cite for doing sort of eight concurrent programming is better scalability. So if you want to do 10,000 connections, uh, having 10,000 threads often turns out not to work very well because if it's operating system threads. Uh, but the reason We've done a lot of this at Soreo, in our team particularly, is it's just easier to reason about because you don't have to think about these locks and these race conditions, things that can go wrong. It's just you can only switch between things at 
So, example, I'm afraid it's a little bit of a wall of text, but we'll work through it. Uh, so we see some new keywords you might not have seen if you haven't done any of this before. And these are new keywords in Python 3.5. Those are the ones in blue. That's oh, async and await. So if we look at this grab function on line 4, that's async def instead of def. That means we're defining a function that can run asynchronously. And I should say the purpose of this example is we're just going to grab the content of two web pages and just look at the first line, which will be the doc type string and just print it out just for a sample application. Um, so then on line five, instead of saying response equals session.getL, we say response equals await session.getL. And that tells us that this is a sort of um, asynchronous operation. So while we're waiting for that response to come back, some other code might run. So that tells us going from before that line to after that line, we have to consider that other code in our program may have run and may have changed the variable of it. Um, in terms of how this AIO HTTP library works, that actually comes back as soon as you've got the HTTP header. To actually get the content, you have to do another asynchronous call, which will wait until all the content comes off from the network, go into the text variable, and then we'll split it to get the lines and take the first line, which is our doc type. Um, so the interesting part now is Next function, grab earls on line 9. And what we're going to do here is we're going to fetch these two earls that we're given in parallel. So instead of sort of sending a request to the first server and then waiting for it to come back, we're going to send up both of these requests, and as data comes back, we'll process it from both of them. And we see we've got these calls to grab on line 11, and we don't have an await keyword there. So these asynchronous functions work a bit like generators in Python, where when you call the thing, it doesn't actually run code. It gives you back an object which is capable of running code. So um, Coro is short for coroutines. So we use the term coroutine for these asynchronous functions. And then we use asynco.gather, which is this function that says, oh, you've got these several things you want to run. It'll run them all concurrently and it'll give you back a list of all the results you get. Making sense so far, I hope? OK. Um, so what version of Python do you need to use this? This is, the, as far as I'm concerned, the killer feature of Python 3. If you still and you come out of this talk saying, oh, that looks great, it's time to switch to Python 3. Anyway, it's time to switch to Python 3. Python 2 is going away soon, but this is the, the lever which you can use to motivate your team that no, really we need to put some work in and pour things Python 3 now. <coughs> so this first went into the Python core in 3.4. 3.5 adds a lot of nice syntactic sugar and things and more features. 3.6 they kind of stabilized it. Um, I'd say 3.6 is where it really got quite nice. Some of it they backported to the 3.5 series so 3.5.2 has some Nice, but some of the libraries now even say you have to have at least 3.5.3. And then 3.7 is just kind of fairly minor stuff. They've now made these true keywords, so you can't <coughs> name any functions or things that previously you could have a variable called async, and it wasn't, and it sort of looked at the context to figure out who we're using as a keyword or a variable name. Uh, there is a backport of some of this to Python 2 called Trollius, but it doesn't have any of the nice tactic sugar, and it's no longer supported. Rather, just put in, bite the bullet now and port to Python 3. So you're going to have to do it one day. Um, I kind of lied a little bit in the introduction that was on the website about this talk. I'm not going to teach you how to write the entire API and all the functions it has, because frankly, no one comes out of one of these talks and says, right, I'm going to sit down and write my code now. You, you're going to have to look up how to use the APIs online. But I'm going to try and explain the concepts and how the pieces fit together and give you some practical tips that when you're scratching your head trying to design your thing or debug it or whatever, you'll maybe come back to this talk. So I think I was kind of built up in these layers. You've got the thing called an event loop right at the core of it, which is the kind of lowest level that you can use. And then there's a key class called future built on top of that, which then everything else is kind of built on top of. Now, sort of work through these layers now to explain what those are about. 
So the event loop is, is kind of very minimal layer. It's uh, got callback. You can say, please call this function at, you know, when it's convenient for you, or please call this function it's later. When available on this network socket, so that I can process it, or when it's this network socket's ready for me to send data. And it's got some various networking things you can do. Interesting thing about this is you can swap out an alternative implementation. So there's talk about SANIC, I think, tomorrow, which is going to mention something called UV Loop, which is an alternative implementation of this, which has got a lot of C code underneath it. It's apparently much faster. I haven't used it myself because we don't have those kind of performance requirements in our async IO code. Um, but using this load API is, is a bit painful because you have it's a style called continuation style where you kind of end up having to break up your functions into little functions every time you want to uh, sort of yield control. So if you want to do a thing and then a second later do another thing, you end up having to code it like this where you do the first thing on line two and then you say, oh, in another second, please call my second step. And then you have to write a new function for your second step. You can't put it all in one function. This, if you look in this, go, oh, yeah, that looks fine. And then you've probably been writing too much JavaScript. It tends to look like that. Uh, there was also one of the first kind of asynchronous concurrent programming frameworks for Python. It was called Twisted, and it, I think it also worked a lot like this. But personally, I'd much rather write my code like this. You've got your sort of logical flow in one function that I'm doing the thing, I'm sleeping for a second, and I'm doing another thing. That's what the of this async onion will give you. So then we'll talk about futures and tasks. Um, the second quote is a bit more useful for this talk. The first one I just like. So a future is a storage for a result that doesn't exist yet. That at some point in the future you're going to say, oh yes, the value is now this. And fairly important point is it can also store an exception. So uh, it represents the result of computation, and that computation may throw some exception. Then you can retrieve that exception when you result of the future. And the future is basically just something you put on the right of an await statement, and it'll, it'll then block your code until that future is resolved by setting the value of the future, and it gives you back the value. And if there was an exception, it'll re-raise that exception, so the exceptions propagate automatically. So, seeing of the future, here's how you might implement the sleep function. You don't have to because asyncode.sleep already exists. But if you wanted to do this, you could create your own future and then tell the event loop, OK, in delay seconds, call the future set result. And we're just going to set the result to none because we don't actually care about the value. We just care that something happened, you know, that the event has happened, that it's now a second later. And then you can say, await that thing. When you call the function, it gives you back the future. And you're now waiting for that future to have its result and the event loop will take care of setting that result in one second. Is that making sense? So if you actually, you can go and open up the async code. It's all written in Python. The sleep function looks basically like this. It has some extra bells and whistles on, but this is the core idea. So this is how you take the low-level API and wrap it up into this kind of more convenient API using futures. Um, there are also things called tasks. Tasks are kind of the processes or threads of async IO, where um, what we've seen so far is mostly serial code. But if you want to actually kind of fork off some separate piece of work and have it running while you're still doing something, that's where tasks come in. So in your run concurrent function 5, you're creating this task from your coroutine. So the actual call, uh, can we see? Yeah, actual call there. As I say, it doesn't run the code. It just creates a coroutine object which can run the code, and then you're passing it to the event loop to say, actually, you take care of running this concurrently with, you know, what's happening at line six, and then a wait is kind of the join of async code where you say, okay, now wait for this thing I launched earlier to finish. Give me back the result, or if it threw an exception, you know, re-raise that <coughs> exception, and I'll catch it if I want to. So, so there's quite a few concepts going on here. There's coroutine functions. That's what you say when you say async def. 
you're defining a coroutine function. When you call it, you get a coroutine. Um, and then you can, as I say, you can use create task on it to turn that into a task that you launch. There's another concept called a waitable. A waitable just means a thing you can call a wait on. And coroutines you can await to mean run this coroutine now and sort of block me until it finishes, like a normal function call. Uh, futures are awaitable and tasks are actually a subclass of future, so they're also awaitable. Okay, um, I'm going to talk about a very cool feature called cancellation, which some of the earlier frameworks, particularly Tornado, didn't have, but I think is one of the killer features. So let's say we've written one of these servers, kind of like I had that pseudocode earlier with threads, where we have a loop which is going to read a request off the network. Uh, if the socket isn't closed, then we'll process it and we'll write a response back on the socket again. See, it's just a wild true loop, uh, or, and we only break it when the connection's closed. How do we shut down the server? How do we interrupt this thing to say, no, stop that, we shut it down? Well, we can, okay, so first this is just the boilerplate to launch this thing, so again, we're gonna use create task to um, you know, fork this thing off and can carry on its own, and you know, at some point when we sh want to shut down the server, we'll say await task. That'll just block, it won't actually stop this task, as long as the client keeps sending us stuff. Oh, is this not working so well? It's dropping out. Okay. Okay. Is this working? Yeah. Okay. So magic is my task or a future. You have a cancel method. So you can say, no, stop doing that. I'm done. And what that will do is wherever it's blocked on a future, which may actually be some levels down in a stack trace, it will... So, so this will, wherever it's your code or your task is currently blocked waiting for something, which you know, will typically be, might be waiting for the network, or it might be waiting for, you know, in that process method, if that's, say, making a backend call to some other remote service, might be waiting for that backend service, wherever it is, it'll throw a, an exception called canceled error into your task. And then that'll bubble out and eventually, you know, an exception will pop out. And we've got the final list, so it will neatly close off the network connection. You can also catch this just like any other exception to maybe tell the client, you know, buy, we're going away. And preferably re-raise it just so you can see the task is cancelled. So you can also use this sort of on the client side. You know, if you make an HTTP request off to some server and it's taking too long and you go, nah, I'm not interested anymore, you can cancel that. Um, so one thing, uh, trap I've fallen into when I started using async -O is I saw this future thing and thought, oh, that'll be a good way to keep track of events that, you know, I'll have some things waiting for something and, you know, so I'll just give them a future and when I've, when the thing has happened, I will set the result on the future, kind of like we saw in that sleep example. Problem is, it interacts badly with cancellation. So let's have a look at an example that you guys will be doing in 20 minutes or so, where you're waiting for lunch, and I'm standing here yabbering on. So there's an event, so you've got a future called lunchtime future, and you might want to eat a sandwich and drink some coffee at lunchtime. So you launch tasks for these, and they'll each await the lunchtime future, and once lunch comes, you'll insert things into your mouth. And incidentally, because this is not threaded, you don't have to worry about trying to stuff a sandwich and coffee into your mouth at the same time and choking. Uh, one thing will happen at a time. And you're hoping that when I finish my talk, I will uh, set a result on this lunchtime feature and then that will trigger everything else to happen. Problem is, what if you actually decide a bit later, maybe I don't want a sandwich for lunch, actually, I'll have something else. So you cancel the eat sandwich task. Eat sandwich task is blocked on the lunchtime future. So that will then cancel that future. 
And in fact, it will, and that means the lunchtime future is now cancelled. So the drink coffee task will see that, and it will also take a cancelled error. And now you don't get to drink coffee either. So when you can, when you wait on a future, or when you have multiple waiters on a future, you've got to be careful because if you cancel one of those waiters, it cancels a future which then propagates into all the other tasks waiting on that future. So a better solution is asynco gives you a class exactly for events, and unsurprisingly it's called event. It works pretty much the same as threading.event, and it doesn't suffer from this problem. Um, another cool way to use cancellation is it's sort of better than timeout. So um, you don't, you shouldn't create timeouts in your APIs because the user can always decide, you know, on this condition, which might be a timeout, or because they got bored or whatever, or some other event happened, they can just cancel the thing you're running. So a simple way to do this is if you've got a, a function you've provided called fetch. Uh, there's a wrapper called wait for, which says wait wait for this thing to finish, but I'm going to specify a timeout. That means you don't have to provide that timeout functionality in your fetch function. Uh, there's another very cool library called async timeout. It's you know, a third-party library installed with pip, and it has a context manager you can r use, which will run the code inside its block with a timeout. And the cool thing here is We've said we want a 10 second timeout to fetch these two things, but we don't need to worry about um, you know, saying five seconds for this one, five seconds for that one. It's just overall 10 seconds. Okay, um, so that's all great if your code is all uh, sort of written with async IO, but if you've got some library uh, which will make a blocking request some service, that, that's a bit of a problem, because when you call that, it blocks the event loop, which means none of the other code you've got runs while you're waiting for that to happen. And that doesn't matter if it drops a gil, so threading, you have the same problem in Python, because Python has a gil, but some C code you can call can drop the gil. All the networking code does this, so that just works out. But not so nice for async uh, There's a couple of things you can do. Uh, one is just accept it. We do this uh, for some of our code, where we make calls to a Redis database, because we know it's running sort of in the same rack or the same row. It's generally pretty quick. We don't, you know, we don't have that many requests coming in. Our control plane is fairly lightweight because we don't have millions of users all trying to control the telescope at the same time. So we just suck it up. Um, you can also run your blocking code in another thread. And there's some nice uh, tools for that. Or switch to an asynchronous library. So to run in a thread, there's this function called run in executor. It will, you just give it a, a th like a thread pool executor and a function to run and it will take care of running the function in that executor and getting the result back and giving it to you in a future. Uh, it doesn't play nicely with cancellation because you can't cancel something that's happening in another thread. You can cancel it if it hasn't started yet, I think, but once it's running, you can't really stop it easily. And it's threads, which we said threads suck. Um, libraries, uh, it's really taken off. You can see for everything from A to Z, there's a, a library for it. In some cases, two libraries for it. You can, uh, this isn't even everything. This is just some ones I found a few minutes searching on the internet. So there's a lot of options here. And if there isn't, you can always write your own. Okay, so that was blocking code. Uh, I'm gonna quickly run through some testing tips because I'm running low on time. Um, so if you've used nose tests, it'll look like this. You've got set up, tear down functions to create your fixture, and then a test function. There's a nice package called async test, which sort of does the same thing, but you can have asynchronous functions for all of these. And it takes care of sort of setting up the event loop, and you can add some decorators to say, you know, whether you want a special event loop just for your test or just standard one. I won't go into details, but look it up if you want to do testing async code. Uh, it's also got a cool uh, class called clock test case, which puts you in charge of the, the clock instead of it running you know, like a normal clock. So in this case, you might want to test a function that you want to make sure it times out properly and raises a timeout exception. So if you see on line 10, we have that self.advance, and that says, okay, please advance time by 11 seconds. And it doesn't actually take 11 seconds of real time to do this. So you can test things that 
you can test timeouts that might be minutes long, and it doesn't mean your test has to take that long. Can be a little tricky because there's now no way to say, oh, just wait a little bit for this data to go into the kernel network stack and back out to my test thing, but you can deal with that. Uh, PyTest also has a, uh, a extra plugin you can get uh, called PySync, sorry, PyTest Async O, and you can just decorate, put a decorator on your test, and then it can be an async test. Okay, um, debugging async O, I won't lie, it can be a bit more painful because suddenly you've got all these tasks going on at the same time, and your stack traces can be a bit weird because they don't necessarily follow your logical thinking about what's actually going on. Uh, the first thing you can do is it's got this built-in uh, debug mode where you set an environment variable, and then you should also turn on debug logging, and you can see more about what it's doing, and it'll also warn you about some things. So here's a common mistake you can make where you forget to put the await keyword in. So you see at line six, we're saying y equals double two, doubles a function that doubles something, but actually doubles an async function. So when we call double two, what we're getting is just the coroutine, but we're not actually executing any code. So it'll print this, whereas you're expecting double two is four. Now obviously in this case, you can kind of see what's going on, but other cases, you know, weird stuff happens, your code just doesn't run, you don't know why it hasn't run. If you set the environment variable, it'll spew out a stack trace, and the key message is uh, the coroutine double, oh, let's see if I can get a mouse, coroutine object uh, running there was never yielded from. That means you never called the weight on it. So you created this sort of potential code, but never actually ran it. Um, similarly, if you accidentally were to use time.sleep instead of asyncho.sleep, that's going to block your event loop. Um, if you run it you know, with debug mode, it'll give you a warning about that. And there's a configurable setting for how long is acceptable to block the event loop. Uh, the other thing I ran into a few times was fire and forget tasks, where you want to start some sort of long-running thing that's just going to go off and maybe run your server. Um, let's say you forgot to implement it, and you just left some placeholder which says raise not implemented error. and You've now said, just run this loop forever, but there's nothing that's awaiting the result of your run server function. Uh, then only when you actually come to shut down the server will you then find out, oh, nothing actually happened. You won't get any logging while it's running because um, the exception is just sort of waiting for something to await this task. Uh, so only in shutdown, it will, it will then actually tell you, oh, by the way, there's a, there was this exception, but no one ever retrieved it to do anything with it. So the solution I normally use for this is any fire and forget task that's just gonna go off and isn't gonna be waited for at a particular point, I catch exceptions there and log them. And that way, as soon as you start this up, it'll say, by the way, the server failed and here's a stack trace, and oh yes, it's a not implemented error because you forgot to write your server, dummy. Okay, uh, another very cool package is something called AIO Monitor. So that's something you import and you kind of wrap it around your server startup. And it runs a TCP server in your process that you can connect to and kind of monitor what's going on inside. Uh, so you just connect it with Netcat or SoCat or any of those sort of things. Uh, so for example, you can run PS. It's a bit of an eye test, but basically it's telling you about all the tasks that are running. For each of them, it gives you sort of one line of you know, what line it's blocked at and if it's finished or pending. And you can get details in these by passing in this uh, cryptic uh, task ID. So if you've got a task ID, something's going on, you can get a stack trace of, okay, where is this sort of background task actually sitting right now and why, why is it blocked? And you can even kill these tasks. So if something's got jammed up in your, inside your server, and you don't want to kill the whole server, you can actually kill off just bits of it. This is great for sort of debugging in production. Is you can just log in and see what's going on with this thing. Uh, it also kind of includes something called AO console, which is, again, a TCP server running inside your process, which you can just connect to, and you can just run Python commands inside it, including asynchronous calls. So you can sort of start poking this thing while it's running. So we use both of those. It's uh, great fun. And that's all I have to say. Um, I think I've just come in, s come in time. Uh, sorry, I had to rush that a bit. I thought I had a bit more time, but... Uh, thanks very much.
Okay, so we've only got one mic in this room. Um, so when you when I give you the mic for the question, give it back to me as quickly as possible so I can get it back to Bruce. Anyone got a question? Uh, I noticed one of your subsections wasn't performance. Uh, are we talking about time slicing now since you're not using threads? And how does that affect performance? Yeah, so this is essentially time slicing. Um, we don't have particularly high performance needs because, as I say, there's a few other services running in our organization which talk to these things, but all our really high performance stuff's in the data plane, not, and this is kind of using the control plane. But people do use this for sort of tens of thousands of connections. Um, I'd say come to the talk on Sanic tomorrow. Uh, I don't know anything about it myself, but it promises to be all about high performance. Yeah, it is still single-threaded. Um, I guess you can scale it by you know, running multiple instances of your process, and that way you can scale out horizontally as well. So if you, if you don't care so much about performance, you just want to have the core API where you don't have to write threads and locks and so on, would it make sense to just always keep the async debug environment variable on, even in production? Um, or does that somehow affect behavior as well? Um, not too sure. Yeah, I think you'll get more logging popping out. Um, I'm not actually too sure what the performance impact is. So I, I, I guess you could try it. And yeah, I don't think it should affect correctness. I think it's just going to give you more verbose logging and, and tell you about things that it doesn't otherwise tell you about. Um, so just a comment on the multi-process um, issue. So there's a library called AIO multi-process that allows you to uh, send signals between multiple, in multiple event loops. Each event loop will do its own thing, but you can then run them in parallel and have a synchronized uh, shutdown and events like that. It's actually quite useful. Anyone else have a... Um, how do you chain coroutines with async IO? So what do you mean by chaining coroutines? So you, so after one of the one of the futures returns, um, you call another one. So it's kind of synchronous to, you know, the first call finishing. Okay, I'm not quite sure I follow, but uh, I know futures do have an add done callback function where you can give it a callback function say when this future has completed please call this callback for me. Can you put another coroutine? So you there? could um, then have a done callback which would then create a new task for your next coroutine. Mm -hmm. Or else you just have a high level coroutine which says await the first one, await the second one. Okay. And then that'll do both one after the other. Okay. Cool. Anyone else? A uh, quick question around your uh, async diff, like if you create a task that where you had it was an infinite loop, so while true, yep. what, ha what would happen in the instance of, let's say that function, that async function called another function from in there and it cancelled itself? Um, so if it cancelled the task... So it wasn't yeah. in the await state at this point in time, it was calling something else and in something that something then cancelled that task that, that it was calling. So uh, oh. basically in, uh, in the sense that yes. what? Not too sure. Yeah, uh, it may. It'll. My guess would be that it would keep running until it got to another point where it was blocking on something, and at that point, it would yeah. take the exception. It it might do something different, though. I haven't tried that. Mm. Anyone else? Awesome. Cool. Thank you all. Um, that's the end of the session. Lunch. <laughs> <laughs>